everyone. Thanks for coming for the seminar. Today we present Dr. Tarek, his PhD candidate in, uh, in biology department. He will graduate this semester. And today he will summarize what he's doing in uh, his uh, project. So far he did a great job. And uh, today I have a meeting this morning and I tell the, uh, the office of Dr. Transkin what he did is amazing and maybe it can help for every diagnosis, not only for autism, for any brain disorder. So what he did is very innovative and again, and what he's doing also is, is licensed by a company in New Jersey. And this company is working you know, with your help to approach FDA to get FDA approval for what he's doing. So again, we'll let Dr. Tarr to share with you what he's doing in his PhD. Thank you, Dr. Young, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Muhammad Tariq Ali. I am a PhD candidate at the Bioengineering Department. I have been working on uh, this project for five years now. Uh, the main goal of this project was not only to uh, build a CAT system to diagnose autism, but also to, under uh, to understand the underlying uh, reasons behind it. So it was a uh, Yeah, so it was a long journey. We had uh, we went through many solutions. I picked two of them, like the the first one that I considered at the first milestone in, the, in this project, and then its drawbacks and how we improved on it to get to the second solution and the the, the project that we are working on right now. So we will first go over the background uh, of autism. Oh, uh, what's the problem of the current uh, diagnosis? Uh, the, our first solution, the throwback, the second solution, and then what are the future plans. So, what is autism? Autism is a mental condition that presents from early childhood. It's characterized by difficulty in communication and forming relationships. And uh, it has many symptoms, uh, like the majority of the symptoms are uh, socially. So it has repetitive behaviors, uh, uh, issues with the language development, social impairment, and uh, the underlying etiology of the autism is yet unknown. So uh, it's, it's believed that it's some sort of uh, interaction between genetic factors and environmental factors. So the, uh, this slide at the beginning of my PhD, it was, I remember that it was one in 54, four year, uh, five years ago. And now it's the, the prevalence of autism is increasing. It has increased in the last uh, 20 years for 200 to 241 percent. It's uh, more common in boys than girls, and 20 percent of the children with autism develop epilepsy at some stage in their life. And the way that uh, right now the gold standard for diagnosing autism is going to a physician or some trained clinician, and then you go through an interview process. And there are standard protocols for this. Uh, one of them is called ADOS, and we have the ADIR. And it's basically like giving some uh, tasks or having a conversation with the subject. And it's very long, it's very expensive, it requires a lot of training, and it's very subjective because it depends on the interaction between the physician and the subject. And at the end, there is the behavior report, and from this behavior report, based on every task, he gets a score. And from those scores, after that long session, you aggregate all those scores and uh, uh, like, a professional physician decides if this subject has an autism or not. One of the issues of uh, this report, as I said in the beginning, it's subjective. It depends on the interaction between the subject and the uh, physician. Also, uh, there is the DSM, the standard that diagnoses most of psychological disorders. It changes. So this score, like if you, if you find a set of scores in 2005, it, it would be diagnosed as autism. In 2020, it's no longer autism, it's asparagus syndrome or something. And, uh, and, 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 and this just shows that it, it requires a lot of training at, uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be qualified to conduct this interview, and it takes a lot of time, and it's very expensive for the patient. So one of the, the problems that inspired our work is how subjective and how variable the decisions or diagnosis of autism uh, among clinics. 
So a subject would be diagnosed in a clinic as a, a subject with autism and in another clinic with ADHD. And it depends on the mood because most of those subjects are kids and depends on that day for the kid, he can interact differently from one to another. And it's, it's just, it, it just inconsistent diagnosis and it's very subjective. So you can't, actually people are following protocol and then you can just tell that someone is wrong and someone is right. So our main goal was to understand and diagnose autism. And the first goal was to understand the neuroetology of autism. So our first idea was how to get this subjectivity of the diagnosis process into an objective process. And the, by objective, we need something that we can measure, not just an interaction with the subject. And, uh, and the first thing, and that was my part in the project that I was concerned with the structural MRI images, which is the morphology of the brain, the geometry, the curvature, the thickness of the cortex. And the and second step was using our understanding of this step, knowing what, what parts in the brain that actually affect uh, autism. Are we going to be able to use this information to objectively diagnose autism without needing any like social interaction with the subject? So the first step we did the literature review, we went through the uh, literature to see if anyone has seen any, uh, if there are any observation of any correlation between the cortex of the brain and with autism. And we found many studies uh, that have even different resolution of the brain, so you can find a study that just defining that the left hemisphere differs in the population of ASD than the left hemisphere of the population of, a of TD. And some like just say the temporal and frontal loop, some other are very like very specific brain regions, and those were statistical studies. And then for the machine learning studies, those were from our first trials, this is from our group. We, uh, they were able to generate some good models to, uh, to diagnose autism, and there are a few others that you, uh, utilize structural MRI to diagnose autism with high accuracy. But there was an issue that the number of subjects was limited, the data is not available, we cannot replicate the results, we can like rerun their uh, model again and study it. So after our literature review, we came up with two uh, hypotheses that we need to test. The first one that there is a set of cortical morphological features that will be able to differentiate between ASD and TD. And there is a classifier or set of classifiers that will be able to utilize this set of morphological features to classify this. And then we designed the first experiment to find those uh, uh, features and the set of classifiers. And so we start from the data acquisition. We go through uh, brain uh, pre-processing. Then after brain pre-processing, we uh, parse the pre-processed brain to a specific atlas in order to know what kind of region we are studying. Then we did some feature adjustment uh, according to age and gender. And then we uh, performed a recursive feature elimination algorithm to select the uh, features which are more related to autism. And then we try to use those selected features into a machine learning model in order to uh, diagnose the subject. And we, trying to avoid the limitations of the previous studies, we first started with Abide One dataset, which is a publicly available dataset. It contains many subjects. So we uh, just downloaded this dataset. We performed the uh, uh, manual inspection on the brains. We found the one that successfully passed from the uh, pre our pre-processing pipeline. I think the data was like uh, 900, and then there was like 300 subjects with issues. Of, uh, either their uh, structure MRI had a problem, just the pre-processing didn't work out with them, and they were 12 sites. So this data set actually is uh, subjects that were recruited from different hospitals across the country, and then the, those subjects were just uploaded by the NIH. It was in, uh, in an NIH uh, project, and they were just uploaded to all their subjects from New York University, Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Ohio State University. Like each site is a university that recruited those subjects. And then we performed the statistical analysis on the data to make sure that there is no statistical difference between the counts, if the data is uh, balanced. Uh, there is no difference in the age between ASD and DD groups. And uh, we found what's being confirmed in the literature that the, uh, there is a statistical di uh, difference between the gender, males and females. 
And then this is just a basic exploratory data analysis where we uh, demonstrate the distribution of uh, the age uh, over each site. So you can find, uh, you can see that for each site, like the data is somehow like uh, uh, balanced, like they, they are all within the same range, but over the whole data set it's not. So this was something for us to consider. And then the counts of each data set. And then we had something like this data set where we have only ASD subject because the TD subject were all excluded in the uh, quality assurance. And the first pre-processing step is the uh, typical one. We just uh, utilized the free surfer software, which is an available software from Harvard. Uh, the the pre-processing steps of MRI brain, the brain uh, it's very typical, it's a conventional, there is no innovation in it. We just go through the, we, you, you can go with the gold standard. You start with the intensity normalization, skull stripping, and then you start segmenting the brain into different parts like uh, gray matter, white matter, the subcortical structures. And then you start uh, putting the labels, like this is the front loop, this is the temporal loop, and so on. And then for the feature extraction, so after, after you finish the pre-processing of the brain, you have every voxel. And each, at every voxel, you have the uh, morphological value. And those morphology that we extracted are the surface area, volume, curvature, and thickness. So we have those four features at every voxel. So the, the voxels, they were like hundreds of thousands of voxels in the brain. So the way we cannot, for every subject, we have this uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of feature vectors. So we needed to summarize the uh, features. We aggregated them into median and into quartile range, and then we performed normalization on the features since each feature is coming from has different unit. Uh, then we did the age adjustment and uh, age, age and gender. So we corrected those features for all uh, for all, for different ages and uh, uh, males and females. And at that time, at that point, now we have our data matrices. So every row represents a subject, and every column represents a feature. So for the first subject, from whatever side, we have the first feature, which is like the uh, uh, median, uh, median thickness of the frontal loop of that subject. So this is the first column. The second column is the median of the temporal loop of the second subject and so on. So we cover all the brain regions for all morphological features. So we end up with a vector of 544 instead of like 10,000. So we have this data matrix for 664 subjects and 544 uh, features. And then we have the output vector. And uh, we created two matrices, one for each site. So we have this for every site, for every hospital. And we have this for the whole data set. And the scoring metric is we use the balanced accuracy score. And then we have the first uh, post-processing, or the first, the first processing uh, section in the pipeline, which is the what I call neural atlas builder. So in this step, we perform for, for multiple classifiers. And each classifier, we think of it as a hypothesis. So I think that there will be a linear kernel, or there is a linear hypothesis, that we can separate the, eight, the morphological features of AD, ASD and TD. So now, I'm, so I'm now using this algorithm, and what this algorithm does is searching for, for the optimum number of sets. What's the optimum number of brain regions or sets? Let's say now we are talking about the features. When I say brain region, I'm talking actually about those features, so the morphology of the brain region. Which is the optimum number that I can use to discriminate between ASD and TD? And then after I get this optimum number, I rerun the algorithm over the whole data set to find those features. So the first step, you get what's the optimum number that can discriminate between the two groups. And then with this number, what are those features? So we run this algorithm over the whole data set and then over each site. And then we just get the number of mutual features. So the number of features for the Caltech the number of optimum features to uh, classify subjects in Caltech is 217. And for the global model or over the whole data set, it's uh, mutual with 74. And this for the rest of the year. Uh, and then for the machine learning model, we just take for each site, like 
in this case, for, let's, let's just talk about CMU. It has 18 features. So we will extract those 18 features, and then we will perform, uh, we will apply it in different classifi uh, classifications. We will, we will just feed it to different classifiers to train uh, on those 18 features from CMU and apply hyperparameter optimization to find the best uh, hyperparameters that can give us the highest balanced accuracy score. And those are the results. And for the sake, and actually, why we split the data set according to sites is for just for the sake of comparisons. So we found this. This was uh, like a, a highly cited, nice uh, publication. It uh, showed the, it showed the performance <coughs> over each site with the accuracy, and then we compared with what we found. And this for the global. So for the global, we first compared with this study. Uh, and this study didn't perform like, it, it, it just, as you see, 20,000 features, it didn't perform any type of summarization. It just took each vertex and used it as a separate feature and then tried to uh, uh, classify with it. And then we did the same thing without using the recursive feature emulation, without using the neural atlas builder. So we didn't ask ourselves what's the optimum number to uh, use for classification. We just fitted the whole feature, the whole brain. And then we got an accuracy which is close to this one. And this is the uh, accuracy when we actually fit the, uh, the data to the Neuro Atlas Builder and we selected specific brain regions with specific morphology. And we can see there is a like, big difference in accuracy. And then at the end, we just counted the number of brain regions which are common over all, which like the intersection point between the global model and all the sites. And we came up with this atlas. And we assume that this atlas actually doesn't depend on the site, doesn't depend on morphology. This is only affected by autism. So those brain regions are the most regions correlated with autism over the whole hospitals, like whole, uh, over the whole country. Those are the morphological features. This is the place in like which hemisphere, and those are the brain regions. And then we had our medical collaborator to, create, to uh, verify the uh, results we found, and he actually created this neuro circuit thing to show that all our findings somehow in the brain are mapped to some uh, task, and this task is actually social. So you will find that most of the brain regions that we found, the circuit like their aggregation together, work on some social task. So this was like our that our first solution to the problem, and this this was the first step. And, and at that time, actually, we have nice results. Everything is working fine. But we found few limitations in this. The first one, that the way we define local sites, actually, it's not the best way to factorize ASD. So the way we, when we build the global system, we, the global matrix, we aggregated all the data set. The second step, we divided the data set across two sites, based on sites. And this doesn't make sense, because this is just the demograph uh, demographic split. And the second, that this study focuses only on structural MRI. So it's like looking at the ASD from only one perspective. And again, the, all the results you have seen are just coming from cross-validation results. There was no training set. There is no holdout set. We just performed uh, cross-validation. And from the software perspective, the code was written in notebooks. It's very hard to reuse or generalize. So we needed to work on those two. Like, as, as Dr. Irvan said, we are we are licensing this work, so it needs to be like reusable and more readable and stuff. So the second solution idea actually it was inspired by the findings of the first one. So we found those neural circuits, and as you see, those brain regions are split into those behaviors. As you see, so the, this first neural circuit is coming to language. The second is attention. And when you go to the phenotype, like the data set we have, you find that there are many columns that we haven't used. So the, the, the data set is not coming only with the diagnosis of ASD and TD, but also with the behavioral reports that we mentioned at the beginning. So this inspired us with the idea, why don't we try, instead of splitting the data based on different demographics and site, why don't we just try to split it based on behavior? So since the beginning, I'm just going to look at people who have, that have difficulties in the language, people who have difficulties with uh, attention. And then we will just try to categorize the data set based, of course, on those scores and try to uh, classify their behaviors. So the second idea was like restructuring our understanding of autism. So now autism is not going to be diagnosed directly from the features we have. But the autism can be explained in terms of different behaviors. 
So we will have communication, and this communication will be somehow we will have some values for it somehow, and then we have the repetitive behavior with values for it, verbal and everything, and then using all those uh, results, we can aggregate them in the final diagnosis. And of course, this is just the new structure of the software. In, be more readable. This is, uh, by the way, it's called the cookie cutter. If someone is working on data science and interested in uh, structuring his project, this is called cookie cutter. You can download it in there. It, it, it just download this structure directly from you. And then, and then the second solution is very similar to the first one, but it added two different phases now for classification. So we have now the first phase of classification, which is only concerned for what we called earlier as local. Uh, classification or local sites. But this time we are not splitting the data based on uh, 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 demography, we are splitting it based on behaviors. And then we are aggregating those behavior for the global diagnosis or the behavior. And then this is the same, uh, but now we change the data set, we are utilizing a byte two data set. Uh, 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 for, uh, for the first solution, a byte one was released, we didn't have a byte two. This solution, a byte two data set was released from more sites, and uh, it like had more quality control. It's like a better version of the data set. And now came the first step: what to uh, what behavior report to select from. So at the beginning, we said that people utilize ADOS, ADIR, and those are like the gold standards for diagnosing autism. But for us, which one should we use? The answer was in data. So we open the uh, we open the phenotype. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This phenotype is like this file you get with the data that explains the behavior report, explains the diagnosis. It's, it's like metadata for uh, for the subjects. So we just counted how many missing data we have. So for the adults, we have like a thousand missing value. So there are thousand subjects we don't know their adults or for creativity. For the ADIR, we have like 800. And then we kept going on until we found that there is a very interesting test called SRS. And this test has the least counts, has the least missing values. And then when we investigated why, what is this test and why it has like fewer missing values, we found that this is like a new test that's coming up. And it's very easy, it's very expensive, and it doesn't require a lot of training. So a, a, a teacher at school can just uh, apply this SRS on kids at school and then get this report. So it's very like usable. So we decided to do this and then we started comparing the counts. So for this uh, data we have now the TD. The TD is typically developed subjects. And then for the ASD we split them uh, based on severity. So for the mannerism, and mannerism is one of the behavioral modules in the SRS. We have this number of mild, have this number of moderate, and then we have this number of severe. And again, for TD, for, aid, for communication, for mannerism, and for the, there are six, there are six, uh, there are six like attributes for the SIS, but actually only five behavior. And this total is somehow they aggregate those scores. So we went through the pre-processing, which is typically like what we did last time using free server and everything, and this is the first phase on this. And for phase one classification, we have now the behavioral reports that we didn't have at the beginning at the, the, for the first solution. And now we have this is the output, which is very similar to the first one, the very similar to the one from the first solution that we got from imaging. So now we have two inputs, the input from the imaging and input from the behavioral report. And now we split the data set into different data sets, and this is the local. The, the first time we said local sites, they were demography. They were like the data set coming from Ohio, the data set coming from New York. Now we have the data set that defining communication. We have a data set that define cognition and so on. And then for each data set, we applied exactly the first uh, uh, machine, the first solution machine learning model. So this is having the neural atlas builder or uh, recursive feature elimination. We get the communication atlas. And then for this communication atlas, you, we use it to train the machine learning model. And then we repeat it for every behavior. And this is like the big picture. So, so th when you expand this diagram, you will find this big picture. So this, you have the different uh, report, behavioral reports, each of them going to one of the RFCV. And again, we are testing different hypotheses. So 
can endless VM with the linear kernel separate between the data, create some atlas that separate between the data? Can uh, LGBM, RF, LR, and LGBM like, like uh, a light gradient? I think this is this is the like the uh, random forest created by Microsoft. It's a new architecture for the random forest created by Microsoft. I think it's uh, light gradient. I don't remember the rest. And then this is the random forest, and then the logistic regression. So we are just checking in any linear or non-linear space, we'll be able to create a set of morphological features to separate between the data or not. So we have for the first model, all the behaviors. Within the second one, all the behaviors. And then those are fed to the machine learning classifiers. Those are the selected classifiers that we perform the hyperparameter optimizations on them. And then we end up for 20, with 24 models for each classifier. So 24 models per six. So now we have mm, too many information. We have too many experiments. And there is a chance that we get a high results by, by coincidence, right? There is a big chance that there is some sort of uh, grouping of subject with su that by coincidence with some sort of uh, configuration of the classifier will give us really high results. And this will be just an overfitting. This is not generalized. So we needed some sort of statistics to make sure that our results is actually generalizable and reproducible. So what we did, we took this whole diagram and repeated it many times. And the number of times we repeated it is 51 times, and this was like the highest number of times I can repeat on the cluster of the university. So I, I was not allowed to do any more experiments. Like this. And then, after we have this 51 experiments, we, uh, we applied our findings, we tested our findings, uh, based on uh, binomial distribution. So the question was, they, this, is, this is the p-value of each feature. And the question is, what if you have seen this feature, this specific feature, this R many times over the 51 experiments, what's the probability of this happening, given that you have selected a set of M size out of the 1,088 features? So this equation answers this. And then you get an, a probability for what's the chance of this is happening. And this probability, you just compare it to your alpha level. We set the alpha level for, with 1%. So if this probability, if the chance of this happens more than 1%, then we will say this is a coincidence. This is not true. If this, if this probability is less than 1%, then we say that this is a significant. This feature actually means something. And then those are the brain regions that were actually selected for each behavior that means something, that's coming out from the statistical analysis. Those are the brain regions that pass the statistical test. And then this is the results of the first phase of classification. As you see, uh, in, the, in the report, they write scores. But then we went back to our medical collaborator to see if we are going to work on this problem as a regression problem or a classification, he said that actually the, the number itself, they are not concerned with the number itself. However, the range. So if the number is something somewhere between 50 to 65, then this subject is going to be mild. Between 65 to 75 is moderate. But the, like the value itself, it doesn't actually matter that much. So we split the data and the behavior reports uh, into mild, moderate, severe. And we test the, we test the, we created a model for each one. So it's like, we are, we are finding the probability of that subject having awareness problem in a mild zone. Awareness problem in moderate zone, awareness problem in severe zone. And then we get this, this, this decision. And those decisions, like this accuracy, is compared to the behavior reports. So for each of those, we have this 98%, which is like a significant increase even from the first one. And this is it's giving us a, a message that now this is splitting makes more sense than the first one that we did over the local, the, the, the demographies we did. Because now we are not like splitting based on sites. Some sites have like, if you saw in the first uh, uh, EDA uh, graph, some sites had like 12 subjects. And this didn't make sense to apply like 500 features to train on a data set with 12 subjects. But now we are working on the whole thousand. So those results coming from the cross validation of the whole data set. And this is just the aggregation to show that what's the accuracy of each behavioral module in diagnosing autism. And the interesting thing of this finding actually that the, in, the, in, the, in the ground truth, in like the behavioral reports of the subjects, you can find that there is a subject with severe awareness and he's not diagnosed with autism. So those behavioral reports actually, 
it's 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 not like it's not mandatory that if you find someone with severe awareness, like very high scoring awareness, like he he should be ASD, his final diagnosis would be ASD. Like the other uh, behavior working factor, and there is a percentage. Like there is an importance, different weights for those uh, reports. But this was like a meta analysis. We didn't include it in the study. But like for the psychology itself, like mannerism actually didn't matter that much. For some reason, didn't matter that much. Like we have a very high accuracy here. But like when you put it in the big model and you look only at the mannerism, you will not find a high accuracy at the final diagnosis. If you could diagnose high mannerism, you will not be able to tell for sure if this person is autism or not. And then this is the second phase of classification, and the second phase of classification doesn't now, now we are, now we are free from the cortex of uh, we are now we're not working on imaging anymore. We have the output, which is the probability. So the first column is like the first column is like for the first subject. What's the probability of this subject to be mild in awareness? This mild in cognition, mild in mannerism, and then those for the first six. And there's a second six, moderate in awareness, moderate in cognition, severe in awareness. And then you create this matrix. And this matrix, exactly what we are thinking of, the analogy, is like the behavioral report that will be put in the hand of the, that uh, expert physician and looking at those scores and decide if this person is with autism or not. So now we are training classifier to be this second doctor who is looking at, who's looking at this report made by the first classification phase and give decision. And this is the, the first one, is the cross-validation uh, accuracy. And as you see, it's, we reach 94% accuracy in diagnosing autism like as a global disease. And this is for the whole outset. So we left on the side uh, this number of subjects, I think it was like 10% or 5% one, one, or something from the data set. And this is the confusion matrix one. So we were able to classify from a whole outset 54, ASD out of 58, and from TD, 86 out of 87. And then we were able to generate actually a report to not only give the decision, but also explain why. So this is a subject that we selected, a random subject from the testing set, and this is the ground truth of the subject. So he's eight years old, he's a male, and those are his scores. And now feeding him to the first phase of the classification layer, you find that those are the probabilities for that subject. The orange, you can think of it as the TD, and the blue, if the probability is above the blue, then this means that he has an issue at this point. And those first one is the mild, moderate, severe. Those are the probabilities. And then for each high probability, we actually create a report. We say that subject had a high probability or high chance like for being with autism, like this probability is a little bit high, because of those cortex. This, this, those morphological regions, more morphological features out of the cortex. So you can see that the main thing contributing to this is the curvature of this brain region in the right hemisphere. And then for the second one, and so on. So those high probabilities. And then after you do this, we go now for the score. This is the probability, this is the final diagnosis. He's diagnosed with, uh, as a TD. And those are the attributes in the, in, in the behavior that contributed the most to this decision. So our machine learning model doesn't only give you decision, but explain them. And we use Lime package for explaining it. It's, Lime package is, is more of a, a, a tool that try to mimic the uh, behavior of your classifier using many linear classifiers. And linear classifiers are very easy to interpret. So it just tries to mimic the same decisions on the training using those linear set. And when it comes a new case for testing set, it just sees the weights that were like had the, the highest weight in decision and say this is why your classifier decided that this subject. So this is how we jump from this high probability, like these decisions, into what kind of features contributed to this. So now what we are doing, we are you are using the cortical features, we are making the mapping between the cortex, between the brain, to the probability of that subject having an autism at this behavior. And then from this behavior, we are going to the final decision and explaining what kind of attribute, what kind of behavior uh, like made the most, contributed the most to the decision. And then the conclusion of the second work that we were able actually to find the morphological feature set to diagnose, to diagnose ASD 
uh, we were able to uh, categorize subjects into different severity scores and different behaviors. And uh, we, we are able to aggregate those decisions into the overall classification, whether ASD or TD. And uh, our proposed framework doesn't only diagnose, but also explain and interpret the results. And then our future work, uh, up to now we didn't confuse, actually this is what I'm working on right now, to uh, confuse the findings of structural MRI with the functional MRI using also the behavior uh, idea. And then uh, generalize over more data sets, so now we can add a by one to our findings and test, like we can use a by two for training, a by one for testing. We can use a whole data set for testing. And at the end, what I'm looking for in the future, not only to diagnose autism, but to create this multi-dimensional space of behaviors where you can cluster different regions in this space and say that if a subject's falling within this region, he has ASD. If subjects fall within this region, he's ADHD, and so on. And this is like my, my dream of this project, that it would create an objective, altern an alternative object objective diagnosing methods for all mental disorders. And this is part of our reference citation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Any question? Any question? Any question? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Like, uh, we know that our plan is to make a correlation between this and the genome. Mm -hmm. During your reading, did you find any people that find in relation between the features and the area and some gene sequence to guide us for the legacy step? Because it's the legacy step for the nearest today. Actually, I, I haven't looked into that. I was uh, just focusing. Yeah, just focus on this idea. Okay. Second, the area that you find in the feature, did anybody in the literature find something similar to it, or yes. we are the first people who do that? Some of them we are the first people, yeah. and this is what Dr. Barton said, that yeah. some of them actually were just theory, but there were no empirical evidence within them, mm -hmm. and we are like, the, this is the first study to point out few of those features, like point out some of those brain regions, there was theory, he, he, he mentioned it, that there was a theory that says that uh, mental disorder is coming from meta neuro circuits, and there was no empirical evidence. And he said that this work is the first empirical evidence for this theory. So I like to, in your dissertation, just to put the feature that is already found by the other people and you confirm it. Yes. And put the feature that you say this is your invention. Okay. And you just propose to get credit for it. This is what we found, this is what is. Again, it, as you mentioned, it is in terms of theory, it is correlated to the autism, but we are the first people who find, do experiment yes. to confirm this. In this case, you can highlight your contribution. Thanks. Any other question? That's the two In this case, we can give hand to Dr. Tarek.